I was born and raised in Abilene, Texas, and came to the hospital the first time when I was two years old, 1947. My little sister was six months old. My dad and mother had found out about the Scottish Rite Hospital through friends or some way, I'm not sure what. I remember the old hospital quite well, but it was a lot different from this new facility that y'all have for sure. The uh, girls and boys were, were in separate wards that were on either end of the, of the main building. And then there was a, a desk where you signed in when you got there. And behind that desk was a room that was had an auditorium in it. And then there was exam rooms. When they called your name, you'd go down the around behind the, the uh, main entrance area. You'd go down around behind it and, and down the way to the to the exam rooms and, and wait your turn for the doctors to come in. And, and then Dr. Carroll would come in with one or two of his assistants, examine you and look at you and see how you were doing or, or what they needed to do to you next or whatever. Uh, down in the exam rooms, they always smelled of plaster because a lot of times they'd be cutting a cast off down there or doing something like that. Down in the basements where the brace room was and it smelled like a saddle shop or a shoe shop. It, it uh, just smelled of leather and, and, and what have you because those little braces, that's all they were made of was, was leather. And you know, those braces, we, we wore them as long as we could because we, we really liked them better when they were broke in. When that leather finally kind of conformed to your shape of your legs and stuff, it they fit up. They fit up around your thighs so high that that they were super uncomfortable if they were new and not broken in, kind of like a pair of shoes might be. Uh, sometimes we'd wear those things until boy, they were just nearly rotten, and we'd still be wanting to to wear them and, and uh, not have anybody put new padding on them or do anything to them because if they did, it took took a month or so to break them in again, you know, and I can remember my old sister pitching as big a fit as I would, you know, when it was time to let that fella down in the brace shop make new new leather for those braces or repat them or whatever he's going to do, and, but we didn't like that at all. <laughs> the boys and the girls didn't co-mingle in the hospital during the week. We stayed in the boys' ward and the girls stayed in the girls' ward, and once a week they would take us to the to the auditorium. They'd push us down there in our beds, in wheelchairs, if we could get in wheelchairs, or, or maybe some could walk. They would go down there to the auditorium, and the boys and the girls. I remember uh, one time, at least, pushing Jane and I's beds close together, and we could we could talk and watch the movie together, you know, and, and we thought that was a big deal because we hadn't seen each other in a week or so. Our parents had to leave us when they came to the hospital. They, they couldn't stay. They could only come on Sunday afternoons and uh, visit us, and just for, oh, two or three hours at that time. You know, they came in at a certain time, and I can remember just about all of them coming in the door at the same time. You know, they were waiting out there for, for it to get time to come in, and, and then they would come in all just all about the same time, and then after a while, two or three hours, they'd, they'd say, well, okay, everybody's got to go now. And so everybody would say goodbye. And it made it hard to see your mother and dad drive away or walk out the door, you know. And, and they'd take you back to the ward. And your mother and dad, you wouldn't see them for most of the time. Then if we were there in the middle of the week, we'd see them again on Sunday. So it wasn't but three or four days, but it, but it seemed like an eternity, you know. But I remember it took several days just to get over staying at the hospital. In other words, your mother and dad not leaving you, but having to leave you, or whatever you might say. But, but uh, that was, that was a, a day or two adjustment. You know, a lot of that time you, you just you weren't very happy at all. We were talking a little while ago, and, and, and Tom Van Hoos was telling you how how mother and dad treated us as children, you know, just like any other child. No special, no special deal, no pity party, no, no anything like that. It was always just, you know, you do your work, you do your homework, you, you do this, you do that, and, and this is what's expected of you, and, and, uh, and there's no, no really getting around it. And, uh, and I've always called it since that record came out. It's the, I've always thought of it as the as the boy named Sue 
syndrome. You know, that's just the way they treated us. They knew it was a tough old world, and if you want to survive, you got to be tough. And um, um, I think, uh, I think, in a certain part of my life, uh, that old that old attitude might have rubbed off too too much. That's the way I was always treated, and it was always the way I my parents treated me. You know, they they just didn't. They just didn't tolerate any exceptions when, when I was uh, in that cast. You know, you still had to, to do all of these things that were expected of you. If you so, what if you broke your leg? You still got to do your homework. You still got to, you know, if you don't go to school, we we got to get the teacher over here to, to bring you the work, and you still got to do it. So, it's just the way it was. And I remember when they fitted me with braces and, and stood me up in the hospital the first time on crutches and braces. Okay, and they showed my mother how to teach me how to walk on those crutches and braces. It was called crutch step, and so you'd take a you'd take a crutch and move it forward, and then you'd take a step with the opposite foot and move it forward, and then you take. And so, anyway, that's the way I learned to walk. And my mother took me home, and Dad took me home that day. And my mother got me up the next morning. She put those braces on me. She stood me up on the crutches and she started teaching me how to walk around the house. And I walked around the house, you know, and I walked around the house for days and days after that, and walked in the yard and walked in the house, and walked on the sidewalks, you know, and that's the way I walked. I remember him being a real nice man, you know, real, sweet and features and, and mannerisms and, and kind, you know, you could just tell he was a very uh, kind man. Anyway, he's just a, when you look at his face even today on a, in that picture, you can just see the kindness in his, his face. What would you tell him if you could talk to him today? surely be how grateful I was. It's a fantastic place. It's just surely beyond the imagination of, of me or anybody that was involved in the, in the beginning of that hospital across the street. You know, y'all were telling me earlier how worldwide it's known now and, and of its uh, information giving facility to all doctors all over the world and all kinds of other facilities. It's kind of mind-boggling that they could go from, from that little hospital across the street and, and Dr. Carroll and his clinic and, to this kind of facility. This is just unreal. And the, and the kids that come here now, you tell me, are only have a three or four day stay on the average and their parents can stay with them and they facility here is is, uh, is just wonderful with all of the kid oriented stuff and the way they, they have the place decorated. Uh, I understand it's it's worth seeing around Christmas time when they redecorate it and what have you for Christmas. I imagine some of the children would would just love to stay here for Christmas. Okay? It might be their best Christmas ever. <laughs>